As computer scientists keep on developing smaller and smaller chips for our everyday devices, innovators are constantly discovering new ways to make use of the decreased size and better performance by using them in devices and places which were previously impossible to even think of. This is especially the case in the field of brain-computer interfaces, where researchers are constantly looking for better ways and technologies to improve the capturing and influencing of the way our brain actually works. Now researchers have developed so-called neurograins, which are some of the smallest microchips ever made and already implanted those directly into a brain to read and write to it. Welcome to today's episode of AI News. In this episode, I will show you the cutting edge of brain-computer interfaces, how scientists managed to create some of the smallest computer chips ever made, and finally, how this new kind of brain-computer interface is an improvement compared to its older counterparts and what abilities it will have. Brain implants are still pretty large, dangerous to implant and can only record from one or two locations. Researchers have now demonstrated that a network of microscopic neurograins can wirelessly record and activate neurons in different locations across rat brains. For decades, scientists have been testing brain-computer interfaces that can record and activate groups of neurons. However, there has been a rising interest in utilizing them to treat illnesses such as epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, and different mental problems in recent years. The majority of existing BCI systems employ one or two sensors to sample up to a few hundred neurons, but neuroscientists are interested in systems that can collect data from considerably larger groups of neurons. Some speculate that they will soon be implanted in healthy people to help us monitor and possibly improve our brain function. Elon Musk stated last year that brain implants developed by his company Neuralink will one day be like, a Fitbit in your skull. But first, they'll have to get a lot more precise and less intrusive. By creating small implants measuring less than 0.1 cubic millimeters, new research conducted by a team at Brown University has made substantial progress on the latter challenge. The implants can record and stimulate brain activity, and they can be linked together to form a network of implants that can be controlled and powered remotely. Engineering techniques to probe as many places in the brain as feasible is one of the major problems in the field of brain-computer interfaces. Most brain-computer interfaces have been monolithic devices until to this point, resembling little needle beds. Our plan was to dismantle the monolith into little sensors that could be dispersed throughout the cerebral cortex. Electrodes take up electrical impulses from brain tissue, circuitry amplifies the signal, and a small coil of wire sends and receives wireless signals are all included in each of the tiny chips. The chips are connected to the surface of the brain, and a tiny relay coil is put over the area where they are implanted to help enhance wireless power transfer to the neurograins. Above the relay coil, a thin patch with another coil is attached to the exterior of the scalp. This works like a small cellular tower, connecting to each neurograin separately using a specifically built network protocol. It also sends electricity to the neurograins. The concept is comparable to that of University of California, Berkeley's Neural Dust, which has subsequently been spun off by company IOTA Biosciences, however their neurograins are an order of magnitude smaller. It's also important to remember that this so-called neural dust doesn't have the capabilities which these new neurograins have due to technically not being microchips. The first video I've made covers this topic a bit more thoroughly. The researchers demonstrated that 48 of the small chips could be implanted into a rat's brain and used to monitor and trigger neuronal activity. While these capacities will eventually be combined into one device, Certain neurograins were developed to record while others were built to stimulate for the sake of the study. The recording's quality might be improved, but the researchers were able to pick up spontaneous brain signals and recognize when the brain was activated with a conventional implant. They also demonstrated that a single neurograin could be used to trigger brain activity, which they were able to detect using standard recording equipment. The company claims that their present setup can handle up to 770 neurograins, but they want to scale up to thousands in the future. That would almost certainly necessitate further downsizing, although the report adds that the chip design should be able to transition from its present 65 nanometer production method to a 22 nanometer one. They also devised a new technique for implanting a huge number of small wireless sensors into soft tissue. 
There's still a lot of work to be done to enhance the quality of the recordings the implants can make, as well as to ensure their safety in humans. However, the capacity to manage a network of tiny implants is intriguing, having a lot of promise for both study and treatment. The researchers also evaluated the gadget's capacity to both stimulate and record from the brain. Small electrical pulses are used to trigger brain activity during stimulation. Researchers believe that the stimulation, which is controlled by the same hub that controls neural recording, will one day be able to restore brain function that has been lost due to sickness or injury. It was a difficult task since the system requires simultaneous wireless power transmission and networking at a megabit per second rate, all while dealing with extremely limited silicon space and power. The research team pushed the boundaries of distributed neural implants. BCI has the potential to affect many aspects of life by allowing humans to communicate directly with technology. Most BCI technologies are still in the early phases of development, and the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the Army Research Lab, the Air Force Research Laboratory, and other institutions are actively researching and funding them. The military of the United States might benefit from the use of BCI technologies to improve their physical and cognitive capabilities. In both the military and civilian sectors, BCI might bring significant medical advantages. Amputees, for example, might have direct control over advanced prosthetic limbs. Implanted electrodes may also help patients with Alzheimer's disease, strokes, or head traumas enhance their memory. Elon Musk and the leading scientists in the field of brain-computer interfaces are confident that technology will one day change handicapped people's capacity to traverse the world, recalling a young neighbor who presently controls her mobility with a joystick. The RAND team produced a toolkit that outlines how BCI may be beneficial in the next years based on their research of current BCI progress and the sorts of tasks that future tactical military units would confront. Some BCI features might be available in a short period of time within a couple of decades or so. Others, particularly those that convey more complex data, may take a long time to mature. The toolkit was then put to the test by bringing together neuroscientists and others with operational warfighting expertise for a national security game. BCI, like any new technology, is fraught with dangers and unknowns. Before BCI advances, developers should think forward and address the ethical and policy concerns that come with complex and possibly terrifying scenarios. Advanced BCI technology, for example, may be utilized to decrease pain or even manage emotions. What happens if military troops are sent into combat with a lower fear threshold? What psychological consequences could veterans face if they don't have their superhuman abilities when they return home? Now could be a good time to consider these scenarios and make sure there are safeguards in place ahead of time. The study includes suggestions for the US government, such as plans to address a lack of confidence in BCI technology among military members who may be asked to utilize them, as well as instructions on how to assure ethical uses. The researchers also emphasize the significance of designing tools that address real-world requirements, rather than falling in love with a beautiful technology and producing something just because it's possible. As BCI capabilities improve, these and other factors might help decrease hazards. There's still a lot of work to be done to make that entire system a reality, but the researchers believe this study is a big step in the right way. My goal is that they will be able to create a system that will give new scientific insights into the brain as well as new medicines to aid those who have had catastrophic injuries. Pretty profound implications. I'm going to go through this super quickly because there's been some really good intros. Um, this work by Professor Jack Gallant, UC Berkeley, through uh, students in MRI machines for hundreds of hours, recording them responding to um, hundreds of hours of YouTube videos. Then showed a new presented clip, and using the scan data alone and deep learning, was able to infer what the students were looking at. I saw this about seven years ago, and I thought, whoa. We just have to up the resolution and put it into a wearable to get a lot more data so we can communicate, you know, telepathically. Japanese group did it with dreams, uh, woke up the graduate students as they fell asleep and asked what they were dreaming about to create the data store. Uh, and you're probably wondering, what's the accuracy? We're not studying all 100 billion neurons here, each with 100,000 dif different connections. That's called causal. Instead, we're going top down. But there's, for example, a word cloud of thinking of numbers has less than 5% uh, false positive. 
this is back to UC Berkeley work. Um, there's even a sex and violence center uh, or map where you're thinking of, of these kinds of things. So you can imagine turning them off if you went to work and maybe didn't want to mention any thoughts you might have of sex and violence. So what is your opinion on this new kind of invasive brain-computer interface? Do you believe that this more classical approach of directly implanting microchips is better than its neural dust counterpart? If so, why do you think so? Please tell us your opinion in the comment section below. I would love to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you for watching AI News. We consistently report on the newest technologies that are shaping the future of our world. We'd appreciate you subscribing and watching our other videos. See you around and take care.